Well, good morning once again. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, if you want to be finding Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah 59, that's where we're going to start. Uh, this message was so detailed, we're not going to be able to finish it this morning, but we'll pick it up again tonight. Uh, but So the first two hours this morning, we'll, we'll, we'll get half of it done, so if you want the other two hours, come back tonight. I'm just kidding. I like to listen to what people are saying and look at what's going on in the world and then begin to ask God what he thinks about it. And it's funny how he always takes me to his word and he shows me. I've been hearing a lot of people talk about revival the past couple of weeks. Uh... And they're saying they want revival. I'm not sure people understand what they want. They say the word revival, but how many truly know what revival is? And I believe that a lot of people have a misunderstanding of what revival is. I don't believe we need revival in this country. I believe we need salvation. I believe most people living in this country today are lost. You see, revival, if you look in Webster's, says it is an improvement in the condition or strength of something. Or another one is to bring back from the dead. Well, before you got saved, what were you? You were dead. An improvement in the condition or the strength of something. Now that, I could see maybe applying to the saints of God, because this morning, you may be, if you're here this morning, and I understand with this number, I would say uh, the majority of the people in this church today, I hope and pray are saved, but I'm not, I'm also a realist, I understand any time you have this number of people that you're going to have a couple that may be still living without Jesus Christ. If that's the case this morning, I want to talk to you. And if you're here this morning and you're saved, God wants to talk to you as well. An improvement in the condition or strength of something. How many of you this morning realize that you need the strength of Jesus Christ in your everyday life? How, how many of you this morning understand how easy it is to be caught up in the traps of this world? Have you ever sat around a bunch of people and they were complaining or griping about something and you see how easy it is to get caught up into that? Well, folks, what do you need to be separate from that? This morning in Sunday school, I heard y'all y'all were in, in Peter talking about a peculiar people. Well, let me ask you something. If you're in a group of people and they're all talking and, and, and they're critical about something and you're the one that's not and you're the one that's positive what are you to them you are peculiar you're different folks it just stuns me the more i study and the more i look around to see there's not many peculiar people out there anymore i want kegelsville church to be peculiar now i don't want us to be weird don't get me wrong <laughs> i want us to be different I want us to be godly. I want us to be holy. And that starts with each and every one of us. And folks, each and every one of us, including your pastors, got a ways to go. But like the Apostle Paul says, you know what? As long as I'm here, I'm going to work at it. And I'm going to strive. And I'm going to seek. But that word, revival, and I'm not going to get too much into tonight's, but I'm seeing things that people are calling a revival that, according to Scripture, just are not revival things. And we're going to talk a lot about that tonight. But an, that improvement in the condition or strength of something, do you think we need to improve our condition? Amen. Well, you see, how many of you want to go to the doctor and get medicine or get a cure for it and, and not tell them what's wrong? Or, how would you like to go in and tell the doctor, you've got a toothache, and he says, okay, you need heart surgery. I'm going to suggest you leave Russell <laughs> and go somewhere else. Uh, just kidding. But uh, <laughs> Anyway, how do you know you're sick? You show symptoms, right? Well, if we need revival... Could that possibly mean we're sick? Oh, yeah. 
What are the symptoms that we need revival? We're spiritually weak or dead. What causes spiritual weakness or death? One word. Come on, Barney Fife. What, what's his favorite sermon on? Sin. Can't get enough of sin. Sin causes spiritual weakness in a saint of God, and it causes death in the unbeliever. Plain and simple. And I'm going to show you in just a second in Scripture where that is true. It's not my opinion. It is the Word of God. But if we are crying out that we need revival, we are actually telling the master physician our symptoms. Amen? We're telling God we've got sin in our life and we need help. If you would, when you find Isaiah chapter 59, if you would stand this morning for the honoring to read God's Word, I'm going to read you two Two verses. Isaiah chapter 59. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this day. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come into this house, Lord, and worship you. We thank you this morning for the Sunday school lesson, Lord, and, and the messenger you sent it to us through. We thank you this morning for the beautiful songs and the children standing and working in your house. God, we just praise you for all these things. Lord, now it comes the preaching of your word, and I just pray, God, first and foremost, that you'd forgive me of my sins, Lord, and cleanse me with your holy blood. And prepare me this morning, Lord, to be a vessel that speaks your word. And God, I pray for forgiveness on all of, all of us that are listening, Lord so that we can hear your word, Lord, and truly apply it to our lives and be what you've called us to be. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Folks, it is very clear when he says, God is still able to hear us and he's still able to save us. God is still on the throne. But what is the problem? What has separated us? In verse 2 he says, But your iniquities or your sins have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, and he will not hear. I want you to know, you know, I, I've heard, I've actually had people disagree with me on this, and I said, look, folks, it is not my opinion. It is the word of God. And I read them this verse. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Here, God will not hear the prayer of a sinful person. The only prayer that God will hear from a sinful person is, Father, forgive me. Now, I, I don't want to get too far into this, but that's the reason I would tell you today I believe most people's prayers are useless. When most people tell you they're praying for you, most of the time it helps nothing. Why do you think it tells you in the book of James the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? What is a righteous man? It is a righteous means you believe. If you remember, we've covered this a lot of times. What did God, when Abraham believed God, his promise that Abraham couldn't see, he said he imputed to him, the righteousness was imputed to him. So it all ties together. To be righteous means you believe. It doesn't mean that you're mightier than them or higher than them or that you never sin because name one of us that never sins. Outside of Jesus Christ, friends, we've all sinned. That includes Paul. That includes Peter. That includes John. That includes everybody who's ever lived except Jesus Christ. So we've all sinned. But you understand, a righteous man understands that he sins. You see, I believe that's the blindness that Satan is casting on us today because I do firmly believe that we're in the last Last days and that blindness makes us believe we're a little better than we are that blindness makes us depend more on ourselves than less on Jesus that blindness says you don't need a savior because you're so good and that false teaching is even coming out now that where it calls us little gods let me tell you something anybody that tells you that you're a little god you get up and you leave that church because that is a antichrist teaching and I want you to know today, that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. We are born lost sinners. We are flesh and blood. But 
in us lives a God once you get saved. God in the form of the Holy Spirit does indwell us. That's why you are called the temple of God. It does not make you God. It makes you a child of God. And if you're a child of God, you're an heir of God, which means one day, church, we can be excited. One day we will inherit the kingdom of heaven. You know, and I heard you talking this morning about the foundation. <laughs> There'll be no cracks in your foundation in heaven, church. Your, your house, your mansion's going to be perfect. It's going to be built better than anything you've ever seen down here. But I want to say, I want to get back to these people crying that we need a revival. We must understand that sin is the one reason we need a revival. Sin, you do realize God never goes anywhere. It says his ear is heavy that he cannot hear. That's because he chooses not to hear because of sin in our life. But you see, can he hear? Amen. Do you think the day that the planes crashed into the, into the World Trade Center, into the Twin Towers, I mean, do you think God heard the prayers of the people as those buildings were clasped, clasped, collapsing down? Sure he did. Do you think if anybody on their last breath whispers the words, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner, do you think he forgives them? Amen, he sure does. If you don't believe me, read the Bible. Because the thief on the cross, folks, turned to him and said, Today would you remember me in paradise. Folks, don't put it off to the last minute. Because there's... While some of those did get a last chance, some of them's last chance come a week before that, some of them a month. Sometimes, you know, the Bible says we can only come when the Father calls us. Do you remember being in a church at one time or being somewhere and you heard the word of God being preached and you could feel a pull on your life? Or let me put it to you this way. This is one I, I, I can personally remember myself. I can remember for a long time when we went to Rock Springs on Sunday night. God would be encouraging me to stand and give my testimony or to stand and thank him. And I can even remember some nights I would reach up and grab the pew like I was going to stand up, and then I'd just sit right back down. I was being called, but something was pulling me back. You know what that something is or who that someone is? Satan. We have an enemy, church. And I can remember, I've seen people, I, I remember we were in a revival one time and, and, and as we were praying, I could see the man. Oh, he wanted to come to God. He'd take a step toward it and, and he'd go back. And I began to watch him and I began, to, I could feel the Holy Spirit working in him. And, and I could feel it happening. I could see him making the steps out and then he'd step back. And I thought, folks, that's a battle right there for our soul. It being where I could actually see, and he was on the back row about where Brother Danny was sitting at this church this night. And I could see him, and his wife was standing beside him, and, and oh, she was praying for him. I, she was probably pulling him. and she was pro But you, I could actually, for the first time, see the battle for a soul. I could see God saying, child, come to me. And the devil saying, brother, you ain't nothing but a drunk. He won't forgive you. You've done too much. You need to stay here with me. But you know what I saw when that night? I saw the Holy Spirit. Because I saw him step out and he took ten steps to that pew. And I told him that night, I said, that's better than any ten-step program this world has to offer you. You just stepped into the master's house. And, there, and you are, as my Bible tells me, if you've truly given your heart and soul to God, you are sealed. Folks, have you ever sealed anything? Any of you ever tried to tear into one of them plastic bags and just finally give up and go get the scissors? Folks, God's seal is stronger than that. God's seal can be broke by no man. And I know today, if that man passes, I know where I'll, I'll get to rejoice because I know where he'll be. But what was separating him from God? The same thing that separates all of us from God. Sin, we may not all have the same sins, but I bet you we have a lot of the same sins. I bet you everyone, I bet most of us in here struggle with pride. But we could pick sins apart, and while we like to say this sin's worse than another sin, folks, sin is sin. In God's eyes, 
Now, there's some he calls abominations. Why do you think he calls it a certain sin an abomination? Because it hurts his children worse. Amen? So, sin, if it separates us from God, we must realize if we're screaming for revival, we must be separated from God. Can I be real honest with you, church? As I'm preparing for a message, did you know sometimes it's a lot easier than others? Can I tell you why? Because <laughs> the times that are easy are the times that I'm close to him. The, client, the times that I'm seeking him, that I'm praying, that I'm reading, that I, that I really, everything I look at, I look at an opportunity to serve God. And then those weeks when I'm more worldly, when I let more of the world in and I've got more concerns about the world or more concerns about this, then it seems harder for me to get in tune with God. wonder why that is. <laughs> sin separates us. In order to get close, we must get that sin out of our life. If we don't, if that man that night at that revival had not made that decision, what would he have earned for that decision? Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folks, it is plain and simple. There's only two options. Sin and death or salvation, and heaven. The wages of sin, we would get what we earn. We've earned death. You understand, justify, justice, I told you this a couple weeks ago, justice is getting what we deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. And grace is getting what we don't deserve. I want you to think about that a minute. Without Jesus Christ, which one of those three would apply to us? Justice. You ever heard people yell for justice if they've been, uh, if they've been wronged? Ken, I'm going to pick on you this morning. Since you're... I didn't know this till this morning, but I learned his uncle's Al, Al Capone. I, I didn't know Diane's maiden name was Capone, but I, I found that out this morning. If Ken robs a liquor store and kills your child in the process, what are you going to want for Ken? Justice. What's Ken's mother who tried to raise him best she could, but, Lord, he just went nuts when he was a teenager? What's she going to want for him? Mercy. If he gives his heart and soul to God and realizes he's a sinner, what does God give him? Grace. See the difference? How many of us this morning are willing to extend grace to other people? Let me give you a perfect example. I used this years ago when I was at, going back to the ball game the other night. I hadn't been to a ball game in a long time, and I told my wife, it is far more enjoyable to sit here and watch when your kids aren't playing. <laughs> you're far more relaxed, and you know what else? You're a far more honest evaluator of what's going on. When you're not personally involved, you can, you can see things for how they really are. But we scream, we want justice. We want, you know, we want fair. That's a lie. I learned it again the other night. How many of you, sports fans, while your children or your grandchildren have been playing, when the referee makes a bad <laughs> call, and how many in here know they make bad calls? Amen. How many of you, when they make a bad call benefiting your team, jump up and yell how bad a call that was? <laughs> you don't say a word, do you? Oh, they're, they're doing their job. They're trying. Everybody. But then, two plays later, oh, your grand, they called a foul on your grandbaby, and he just touched him. Rawr. Here it comes. I've been there. I understand. 
Some of you have photographic evidence of how mad your pastor can get, but that's... Anyway, we don't want fair, do we? We want it tipped in our scale. We want it tipped to our side. Who's the only true fair judge? Jesus Christ. And he earned that, don't you think? You know, and I, I had to sit there the other night and think about how many times I wonder how many times I got mad unjustly at a call or unjustly because I had a child playing. I was biased. And folks, some of, some of you are just as biased as I am. I know I've sat by some of you. It's, it's, just, it's just how it is. But let me tell you something. When you don't have somebody in that mix, it's very easy to be fair when you look. But I want you to know, God has somebody in the mix because he sent his son, but he's still fair. He's given each and every one of us a fair shot, actually more than a fair shot. How many of you, besides the pastor, did he not give up on when he should have gave up on? But he stayed with us. I want to tell you, people treat revival as a magic pill. They think if we could have revival, everything's going to be fixed. If we just have a good revival, problems will go away. Y'all have to forgive me. I'm so trying not to go into tonight's because I don't want to jump ahead. Is revival something you can go to? Like, I'm going to have to cheat a little bit. For, you, for those that come tonight, this be, you're going to get a double dip, but I'm sorry. Is Kentucky the only place that can have a revival? Do we have to go there in order for that to come here? Is revival something that you schedule, that you can... Like, you know, we've had one before we, where several churches get together and then a different preacher preaches every night, and we call it what? We're holding a, a revival. When we held our revival, and I remember I was there every night, nobody got saved. Not a soul got saved. So is it a revival? Can I tell you? What equals revival? One word, and nobody wants to talk about it. Obedience. Plain and simple. If we want to see revival, if we want to see the lost saved, if we want to see the saints of God strengthened, how about we obey the Father? How about we obey what his word says? And you say, well, I, I do obey. Do you? If, you, if you're a, a student of the book of John, he tells us probably more in the book of John than any other book, what do we do if we love God? We obey him. And what does he tell us to do? What's the greatest two commandments? The first one is to what? Love your Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second one's like unto it. Who, who are you supposed to love? Your neighbor. Uh, thank you. Not just a few, but all of them. Do you think if we had that kind of love, we'd see revival in our world? We sure would. So revival equals, equals obedience. But you see, we must decide that we want God, and then we must seek him. I'm not going to ask you to answer this out loud, but if God... If you were in front of God today, if your time was called, how would you answer for this last week? Did you seek God this last week? Did you read God's word every day? Did you pray every day? It's a decision you must make. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. You ever heard that verse? Did you know I didn't read it at all? May I finish it? I'm going to go back and start again because so many times I hear it preached and taught and that's where they, that's where they stop. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Amen. And they go on. Wait a minute, there's more to it. 
Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Folks, that is what's wrong with us today. That is why we don't have revival. We got too much world in us. We claim Christianity, but we live like, like heathens. Folks, I'm going to... You cannot be a good, true, God-fearing child of God if you don't read His Word. I can't make it any clearer. If you don't know what the book says, you are subject to be led astray. And what I see today is false preaching. I listen to it on YouTube. Every, I try to listen to it two or three times a day to hear what the enemy's trying to tell us. And folks, he's trying to... Do, and it's working. I see people believing lies and they'll use part of a scripture, but they don't know what the rest of it says. If you don't know what the book says, then you can be led astray. And folks, we are living in a time where I believe Satan is sending a strong delusion. He's trying to, he's trying to mislead as many as possible. Why do you think the attack is heightened right now? Because I think our time is about up. And folks, it scares me to death. And people don't want to admit they're sinners. I hear, I, I, there's churches that won't say the word sin. Folks, if there's no sin, guess who you don't need? Jesus. Draw nigh to God, seek him. Read, draw, and he will draw nigh to you. We don't have to go to Kentucky to have revival. If we want it here, folks, guess where it starts? With us. All we got to do is obey him. And what does he tell us? Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. That's us. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Get your foot out of the world and put it into God. The best picture I could ever draw for you today, what I see in the, in the Christian world today, and it's happening in churches. You know, that's the one thing I don't know what went on out there. I can't tell you if it was of God. I can't tell you if it wasn't. I don't know because I wasn't there. But here's what I can, I can tell you one thing. This is what really made my heart stand up is the, the president out there said, hey, we've got nothing fancy here. We don't have big screens. We don't have big sound systems. He said, we got wooden chairs and a pew. Folks, when did Jesus become not enough? <laughs> he is more than enough. You don't need an entertainment system. You don't need a rock band on a stage to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. What you need is people with pure hearts that are seeking God, plain and simple. But you see, there's only one way that we can cleanse ourselves this morning of our blood. What's that green soap they used to sell? Uh, what? I heard somebody say it. Lava, yeah. That's supposed to be the toughest soap known to man. It, that's a man's man soap right there, they said. It'd take off all the dirt. Folks, you can scrub yourself all you want to with lava soap and you cannot wash your sin away. It is a stain that you cannot get out. But when you let God apply his son's blood to your sin, you become spotless. Not because of who you are, not because of what you do, but because of whose blood is applied to your life. You see, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, I want to close with this. Revival is not a magic thing. There is no secret being hid from you. It's not one thing that's confined to a church. It's not one thing that's confined to an area. Revival can be had at any time, at any place, by a child of God who sim simply chooses to obey their father. What do you obey? Now see, I want to close with this, and this is, we're going to kind of get deep right here right as we close, but I want to encourage you to come back tonight because we're going to pick up right here. What is the one thing that you... I've told you this before. A lot of the false teaching I hear is on one word, and it's based on mercy. They want to abuse the word mercy. 
They want to tell you that mercy is a license to sin. The, the scripture tells you, oh no, you don't have a license to sin. God forbid. Mercy is to encourage you not to sin. But if we obey, what are we obeying? If you drive to town every day and you never exceed 55 or in the school zone 25, you're obeying what? The law. Did you know, <laughs> regardless of what anybody you hear preach tells you, guess what a Christian is still supposed to obey? God's law. Now, do we obey it for a different reason than they used to? Amen. Do we obey it today out of love because Jesus Christ is in us and, and, and now the Holy Spirit guides us? But does that give us a license to sin, to break the law? Of course not. So as I close, I want to read you Psalms chapter 19, verse 7. And listen to what it says about the law. And again, we'll pick up here tonight. But we're talking about revival. We're talking about sin separating us. So if sin separating us, we're obviously breaking what? God's law. Psalm 19, verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Folks, our colleges and universities may not be teaching our children about Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, most of them aren't. But if they know Jesus Christ makes everything, it makes the simple wise. You see, you'll, I hear a lot of people preach that Moses brought the law and Jesus brought grace. That is exactly right. But where they're trying to mislead you is that the law no longer applies. Folks, the law is still the law. And we just read in God's own words, that his law is perfect. And what is the mission of the law? Why did God send the law with Moses? To teach us that we needed a Savior. Because nobody could keep the law without breaking. At least one of them. The law has a purpose. And what that purpose is, is to remind us that we're sinners. And that we need a Savior. Folks, in order for us to have revival, we must realize we're sinners and we need a Savior. We'll pick up with that tonight. But what I want to leave you with this morning is you don't have to drive anywhere. You don't have to come to this church to start a revival. The one place each and every one of you can start a revival this morning is in your own heart. And what he told me very clearly last week as me and my wife left, left church last Sunday night and I made it all the way home and I, I got in the hallway and he spoke, to my, he spoke to my heart as clear as he has in a long time. And that was, son, you can start revival in your own life. You don't have to go anywhere to get me. I am everywhere. Seek me and you will find me while there's time. If you would, stand with me all over this building. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning and close your eyes. And I have one very simple question for you this morning. If you drew your last breath today, do you know where you would spend eternity? Do you know that you would be in heaven with Jesus Christ? Or this morning, would you be in hell in a place that was never intended for you? If you're here this morning, it is not by accident. You're here by divine plan. And I'm going to tell you, if Jesus Christ is knocking on your heart's door this morning, do not, do not neglect this opportunity. It may be the last one you ever receive. You see today, February 26, 2023, may be the last day you walk on this earth. Today may be your judgment day. If it is, friend, and you're not sure of your salvation, please hear me this morning. Jesus Christ is here today waiting on you. Just like that battle I saw that night in the church, 
God's calling you, but Satan's saying, oh, you got all the time in the world, friend. Satan is a liar. If you need Jesus Christ this morning, this altar is open, and I invite you to this altar and where you can talk it over with Jesus Christ and you can tell him what he already knows, that you're a sinner and that you need his blood to cover your life. Friend, that's something every one of us needs. And I just pray that we've all received it. But if you're here this morning and you hadn't received it, don't let the enemy tell you it's something to be ashamed of. The only thing to be ashamed of is leaving here without accepting the love of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness. If you're here this morning and you want to make salvation, if you want Jesus to be the Lord of your life, if you want a, di- if you want a new life, if you want things different, if, you've, if you're tired of trying the old way, if you're tired of getting kicked and kept down by the enemy, friends, I've got to, I know my friend, he is a savior and he breaks chains. If you're here this morning and you need that, I feel it this morning in my heart. I know someone's here and need it and I know that battle's going on. But it's your decision, friend. No one can make it for you. We can pray for you and and we can hope, but it's up to you. What do you want? Do you want heaven? Or do you want to neglect it and spend your eternity somewhere where it's never meant for you? Maybe you're here this morning and you're already sealed, but you've let sin separate you a little bit. Maybe you're not hearing from God the way you want to. Maybe you hadn't been reading. Maybe you hadn't been praying. Folks, we all get into that. But you cannot stay there. This morning, if you want some help, if you just want to reach out, if you just want to talk to God about anything this morning, what a special opportunity. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in His name, He is present. Folks, He is here today. Jesus Christ, the one that hung on that cross, is here today. If you need a touch from the Heavenly Father today, this altar is open. If you need anything this morning.